Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Levy. I'm a cardiologist, also interestingly enough, a, a lawyer. But I've been working for the last 20 years on trying to promote the science of vitamin C, explore why vitamin C has the amazing properties it has. And as a part of that, I've encountered and this occurred some 11 years ago, a new, at least to me, and I think to many other people, formulation of nutrient delivery called liposomes. And in the course of working with liposomes, I've come across some, to me, very incredible findings, and I want to present this information to you so that you could appreciate that liposomes are a unique delivery system of nutrients and other things you want to put inside them to get into areas of the body that sometimes you're not even effectively accessing by intravenous forms. So this is something I think that could be useful to all healthcare practitioners and can allow a great deal of improvement for a lot of people that aren't getting the results they want right now. This slide shows you how you can check some of the references that are listed throughout the presentation. There's always a number, and if you go to the PubMed website and type in that number in the search box, you'll go straight to the article that's being cited, either just in the abstract form or sometimes the entire article. <clears throat> now, in understanding how liposomes do what they do, the first thing we need to do is consider a definition. And that definition is of the word or concept bioavailability. And this is important because there's a bit of misunderstanding as to what bioavailability is, and a lot of people just think it means you can put it into the blood, that's 100% bio bioavailable. And in fact, we start with the fact that bioavailability is the degree to which a contained substance becomes available to the target molecular site after administration. And for a nutrient such as vitamin C, it also means that the targeted site is intracellular, inside the cell, even though it can have impact outside the cell as well. As I mentioned, many scientists consider bioavailability to mean that something that goes directly into the blood is 100% bioavailable. However, this is not really the case. Because if a target site of physiological activity is simply circulating in the plasma, then yes, intravenous administration would represent a 100% bioavailability. However, this is usually not the case. Furthermore, there can be degrees of bioavailability as a nutrient can be utilized at more than one molecular site. For example, vitamin C and glutathione are utilized in both intracellular and extracellular spaces and the antioxidant impact of glutathione is primarily intracellular. Now, a few more points about bioavailability. Not only can bioavailability mean does the substance that you're taking get inside the cell and not just into the blood, but can it get inside the different intracellular organelles, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticula, even the nucleus. So remember that the ultimate effectiveness of a nutrient or drug, <clears throat> even if it's been shown to be extremely beneficial in vitro, in the test tube, uh, in an isolated circumstance, inside the body, that substance, that agent, that treatment needs to get where it needs to go or it can't have the effect that you want. So, and with regard to liposomes, we'll talk about this in a moment, it's also important to know Whatever your delivery system is, what determines whether it's a superior delivery system is not only 
whether it gets where you want it to go, but also how much energy is consumed in order to get it there. Sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. If you have to consume energy to get an energy delivering substance like vitamin C inside the cell, the vitamin C is still of use, obviously, once it gets inside the cell, but you've made an energy expenditure to get it there. And in terms of the global health, that's not as desirable, obviously, as getting the vitamin C inside the cell without the expenditure of energy. So that's always your most desirable goal in therapeutic supplementation is to get something at the target site, usually inside the cell, but without the consumption of energy. Now, a little background on the scientific history, if you will, of liposome science. It was in 1965 that a researcher by the name of Bangham reported that when you exposed in just the right fashion enough phospholipids to excess water, the phospholipids spontaneously formed lamellar substances that could effectively encapsulate whatever was dissolved in the water. And this was the first description of liposomes being formed outside the body. Another interesting thing that resulted from this is since the liposome has a cell wall that is virtually identical to the cell walls of the cells that are naturally in your body, amazingly enough, this resulted in liposomes becoming a experimental model and for basically a relatively new field called cell membrane biophysics. So after it was realized that you could entrap solutes inside liposomes, then that led to the concept of drug delivery, not just nutrient delivery. And a large amount of research went into looking into, and probably the majority of the research, into delivering smaller doses of chemotherapy for cancer more effectively and with less side effects. And very early on, 1976, and this should be of great interest to anybody listening to this, to realize the impact that liposomes can have, is we all know you can't take insulin orally. Insulin is a huge molecule, many, many, many amino acids. You take it in the stomach, it gets broken down. You have no insulin that goes from your GI tract into your blood. Well, the proof that liposomes can do this and deliver a large protein molecule like insulin orally and still get it into the blood, it was demonstrated long ago that a protein like insulin given orally in liposomes would have glucose lowering effects in rats. Now we haven't refined the technology to the point of doing this to people, but the point is, is that the barrier represented by the stomach and the gut breaking down proteins can be completely bypassed by the use of liposomes. Now, I would say, and it's certainly my opinion based on the liposome science that I've reviewed and studied over the years, is that the liposome can be considered to have evolved over the last 50 plus years from what was initially a structural curiosity into what may now prove to be the most significant and effective way yet discovered to deliver nutrient and drug payloads into an optimally bioavailable manner into the, inside the cells. Better than, and sometimes much better than, giving it directly intravenously. So, let's then look a little bit more at the structure, the actual structure, the way a liposome is put together. A liposome is a nanometer size microscopic, microscopic sphere on the order of 100 to 500 nanometers. And it has a phosph phospholipid bilayer, stable in water and able to contain a water soluble substance. When you're just making 
regular plain liposomes because I'm going to show you later there's ways you can modify them. The, phosphat the phospholipid that's used is typically phosphatidylcholine. And as I mentioned before, I'll re-emphasize it right now, the conformation and the content of the phosphatidylcholine in the li liposome wall is virtually identical to the configuration of the phospholipids in all the cells of the body and in the walls of the intracellular organelles, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic plasmic reticulum, they all have this phospholipid bilayer as a wall. So, a liposome can be viewed as a laboratory model for a cell in the body. All right, so, now these phospholipids that make up a liposome have an interesting structural characteristic where they have a large water-seeking head and a long fat-seeking tail. And when you put a substance like this in water with the right forces applied, you get a layer of two molecules lined up together with the fat-seeking tails against each other and the water-seeking heads on the outside. So that if you had something dissolved inside the water before these forces were applied, you now have something that naturally forms a sphere that has a lipid bilayer membrane amenable to water solubility on the outside and containing a water-soluble payload on the inside and only having fat in the wall itself. And this is represented by this particular schematic where you see exactly what I described. And of course, that's just an artistic's rendition, artist's rendition. And when you look at an electron microscopic picture of a liposome, you can see that it's very similar here. The, the rings, the two rings represent the water-soluble large heads of the phosphatidylcholine. Now, I'm going to talk about a number of things that have sort of gotten confused with liposomes and why there's a lot of information out there about homemade liposomes, ultrasonic cleaners, this out of the other. I'm going to tell you, I believe the evidence will show that these do not make liposome, but they do make some other things that are capable of improving the absorption of what you're trying to get into the body, but nothing to the point of what a liposome can deliver intracellularly. Now, when you have micelles, micelles form also. When you have polar and nonpolar molecules like the phosphatidylcholine along with something water soluble. And in contrast to what we just saw about the structure of the liposome, this, this is what's called a micelle or a reverse micelle, but you can see there's no, in either one, there's no internal container. So, However, these things are absorbed better into the gut, so they will get what they're associated with more absorption into the blood, even the lymph, than just something without this, but it will not have the quality of the liposome to get inside the cell. Now, <clears throat> so in many ways, on my cell, can be considered an emulsion. And probably the most practical way to think about an emulsion is to think about how you can dissolve fat into water and clean your dishes. A, de a detergent allows an emulsification. It allows you to use water to clean off fat because it's an intermediary that will allow itself to dissolve or associate with water at the same time it dissolves or associates with fat. So, an emulsion then is an effective mixture of incompatible substances, fat and water, without the presence of a liposome encapsulation process. 
And when these mice cells get very large, they can be considered microemulsions, okay? I'm going to go into digestion in a moment, but in the digestion, it has to do with how big the fat particle is, and when it's a small enough fat particle, which a properly made liposome is, we'll find that the liposomes can be directly assimilated into the lymphatics from the gut and not go into the portal circulation from the gut. So here's your liposome and there's your micelle. You can see that the micelle still associates something that has a water-soluble and a fat-soluble part, but it has no central payload-containing core. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about what I would call roughly liposome equivalents inside the body. I say this because there's now a lot of data that shows that the body either makes liposomes for intercellular communication or substances very similar to liposomes. The general term for these structures are called extracellular vesicles. They're important naturally occurring players in intercellular communication. Also, they've actually been found in all of the bloody fluids that have been tested. Just like a liposome, they have a bilayer lipid coating, just like all the cell walls. And they've also shown that these vesicles can have both physiological, beneficial, or pathological, clinically negative consequences. So sometimes they can transport good things from cell to cell. Other times they can transport toxic things from cell to cell. But remember that the membrane structure is the same as a, that of the cell membrane wall or the, of the wall of a subcellular organelle. They've also been known, as the reference shows, that they can help convey immune responses. And this is important because if something's happening in one part of the body, did you ever wonder how another part of the body finds out about it. And this is part of the critical role that extracellular vesicles play. So now, in the literature, we have basically four categories of these extracellular vesicles. And they're differentiated by where they arise and by their size. So we have exosomes, which are the smallest, microvesicles, apoptotic bodies, and liposomes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each category. Now, exosomes were discovered about 30 years ago, but they were only seriously studied. It's kind of interesting, unless something seems interesting or a researcher is going to get a certain positive nugget out of it. They don't necessarily concentrate on researching something as intensely as they would otherwise. Because when exosomes were first discovered 30 years ago, they were considered to be something along the lines of cellular garbage cans. In other words, vesicles that would round up the byproducts inside the cell and then extrude out the cell and be a means of relieving and getting rid of waste. And those functions pertain as well, but also, as I mentioned before, they play a strong role in intracellular communication. These exosomes are fairly small, fairly tiny, generally 40 to 100 nanometers in diameter, and very homogeneous in shape. They're not a bunch of, bunch of different sizes in general, but where you find them, they tend to be of similar size. And they've been documented to be secreted by many cell types found in sperm, urine, plasma, bronchial lavage fluid, and they are involved in protein storage as well as protein transport and release. And they also play a role in modulating immune function. The next one, the microvesicles, you can see in the second part of the slide, these are larger, 
100 to uh, 1,000 nanometers in diameter with variable shapes. And these are formed by an outward budding of the cell membrane. That's why I said it's important to realize that the liposome and the extracellular vesicles and the cells inside the body themselves all have the same configuration in the cell wall. They have these phospholipid molecules, water soluble on the outside, fat on the inside, water soluble on the outside, fat on the inside, and it's a lipid bilayer so that you can get both in the cell by coming to the cell, merging with that, and depositing what's inside, or you can go from inside the cell and make your way out. So it's a way not only of storage, but it's a convenient way that you can get something from inside the cell out and from outside the cell in simply by a merging of this bilipid membrane. Apoptotic bodies. Apoptosis or apoptosis, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I've heard them all. I say apoptosis, that's my preference. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. When the right triggers have been delivered to a cell and oxidative stress gets high enough inside the cell, it's basically an auto-destruction of the cell. But it's not a frank rupture or necrosis. It's where the cell shrinks down, and as the cell gets more oxidative stress, it gets more toxins inside it, it contracts. And as it contracts, the pressure inside that cell increases and allows an outward blebbing of the membranes, and that's what forms these large apoptotic bodies. They're very large liposome-like vesicles that form in the, pro in, the, in the process of programmed cell death. Now, <clears throat> so those are the things that are related to, to related to liposomes that we know about inside the cell. So looking more specifically now at the liposome with that background information in, in mind. So we know that liposomes can be produced artificially. We know that they're structurally very similar to the other extracellular vesicles I just talked about. And that they use the properties of naturally occurring extracellular vesicles to transport their payload into the cytoplasm or into the intracellular organelles of cells. There's some debate now over whether liposomes are just man-made or whether or not they occur naturally in the cell as well. I suspect they also occur naturally inside the cell, but it's not really important to this particular discussion as to whether that is or is not true. And we now know that multiple sizes and modifications can be made to liposomes with a wide variety of payloads, both inside the liposome and also attached to the fatty portion of the cell membrane. So what are the type of liposome modifications that can be done and have been done? Size. Also membrane thickness. In other words, you can have a single bilayer around it or you can have multiple bilayers around it, sort of onion-like if you will. You can also have <clears throat> a variety of phospholipids comprising the membrane. You can have phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylglycerol. Obviously, there's a wide variety of things that you can put inside the water-soluble payload, the encapsulated substance. And you can have a wide variety of substances that attach or are incorporated to the fat soluble area of the lipid bilayer membrane. Basically, everything in the body falls into liking water or liking fat. And with a limited species of molecules, they're sort of uh, detergent-like, if you will, that can allow an assimilation of a certain substance into fat or water. The other things you can do to liposomes are 
quite a few things, and these are documented in the liposome literature. They're not involved with the simple liposomes that we're talking about and the delivery of such things as vitamin C, glutathione, or even alpha lipoic acid, or even the B vitamins. Now, liposomes can also have a large number of different surface modifications that affect their physiological and their chemical functions. And these surface modifications involve entities being attached to the outside of the liposome membrane, such as immunoglobulins, protein antigens, peptides, antibodies, polyethylene glycol. And these obviously affect the physiological impact of the liposome. And these are the type of modifications that are made when liposomes are being used to deliver chemotherapy, which is a lot of the liposome literature. There's also a sensitivity to pH. Some liposomes will destabilize in an, under an, an acidic environment, allowing it to deliver its payload when the pH changes so that you have different triggers for when the payload gets delivered. Then you have whether the charge is positive or not, the way something acts or accesses areas of the body depends a great deal on whether it's neutral electrically or positively charged. And all of these variations, as I said, are part of what is manipulated now to see if not only can you get a liposome to be absorbed well, but if you can change its nature so that you can predetermine what cells it's going to go to. Now with all of that said, the liposomes right now that we take in supplements are what's called unmodified liposomes. Unmodified liposomes are the just when you put the right forces on them, the, the liposomes that form in the aqueous environment with the phosphatidylcholine, and these are best for delivering antioxidants and nutrient payloads to all cells not for targeting a specific cell population. Because even if you have a way to get something inside the cell, it's not desirable for every cell to get that unless it's something like a nutrient or an antioxidant. So you don't want your chemotherapy to go inside all the normal cells. So this is why unmodified liposomes are best for delivering a substance that's desirable for every cell in the body to have. What are the characteristics of an unmodified liposome? You can take them orally. Typically, you, you take them orally. Uh, under certain research circumstances, they could be given intravenously as well. But due to the bio delivery and the bioavailability of liposomes, that's not really necessary. So you take them orally and when they're in the stomach, think about this. First of all, the payload is protected from the stomach. So you don't have any degradation of what's inside the liposome, such as you might see with something else that's exposed to the digestive enzymes. And then conversely, in the other direction, if the substance that you've encapsulated normally irritates the stomach, the stomach is protected from that. So the liposome protects in both directions. It protects the payload from the stomach. It protects the stomach from the payload. So there's no interaction then between what's inside the liposome until it's finally, de finally delivered. Also due to the extremely tiny size of liposomes in the most of the commercial preparations uh, are giving liposomes 100 to 500 nanometers. These are very highly effectively absorbed. Some of them not only go in by reverse pinocytosis, but they're also able to enter uh, cells of the gut and later on cells of the body by passing through cell, cell wall pores. The other thing, and I alluded to this earlier, that a unmodified liposome of the correct size can do is permit deep intracellular access. 
it could go directly to the cell wall of the cell and deposit its contents in the cytoplasm, or it can pass through small cell wall pores and then do the same thing to the mitochondria, to the nuclei, to the endoplasmic reticulum that it would have done to the outside of the cell wall. So you have a very large number of different places the liposome can ultimately deliver its contents. Very importantly, and this is appearing to be an extremely important consideration in the therapeutic value of liposomes containing antioxidants such as vitamin C, is that there's an incredibly enhanced uptake of liposome contents inside monocytes and white blood cells. And then after exposure to these immune cells which surround the gut, it makes, it way, makes its way into the lymphatic circulation and ultimately then gets into the general bloodstream. But remember, when the liposome encapsulated substance gets into the bloodstream, that's not the same as being given IV. When you give it IV, it's just that and nothing else. When you, if it's encapsulated in the liposome, it's an entirely different entity than if you just gave it unencapsulated through the blood. And although it's not practical clinically yet, uh, an unmodified liposome has been shown to be effective orally by direct injection into the blood, by inhalation, and topically. There's a lot of liposome preparations out there now they're developing for the skin. And I can tell you from my own personal experience and with friends, I've certainly come to my own conclusion that something like a liposome encapsulated vitamin C applied to the skin can rapidly stop and reverse the damage done by an acute sunburn very rapidly. So, when I say liposomes have intravenous impact when taken orally, why would I say that? Okay, well, first and foremost is that when you take something intravenously, much of the time, it depends on the substance, it depends on the nutrient, much of the time to go from the blood to inside the cell you need an active transport mechanism, which means energy must be consumed to get that substance from being inside the blood to inside the cell. Now, if you can take something by mouth that's completely absorbed, and then once in the blood, still with the liposome configuration, if that can get its payload inside the cell without the consumption of energy, then that's vastly more desirable. So this is what we call an energy sparing delivery of the payload. <clears throat> now, specifically, two of the things that are very commonly encapsulated these days because they're very important nutrients and antioxidants are glutathione, which is the most important and most concentrated intracellular antioxidant, and vitamin C, the most important extracellular antioxidant. And the two together because one regenerates the other. Well, glutathione is a tripeptide. Three amino acids attached together. And even when you give glutathione intravenously, within a minute or so, the proteases of the blood have broken down that tripeptide into three separate amino acids. So you've got no more glutathione intact Circulating inside, circulating inside your blood roughly a minute after it's injected. And in order to cause glutathione to be present inside the cell from the glutathione injected into the blood, you need three separate energy requiring transport mechanisms to get the three amino acids into the cell. And then once those three amino acids are in the cell, you need two different ATP-dependent enzymes <clears throat> to synthesize the final glutathione molecule. So, even though you gave it intravenously, which everybody, well, not everybody, but nearly everybody still thinks is the, the superior way to give anything, 
you have to consume energy five separate times to have that molecule appear inside the cell. And with a properly liposome encapsulated form of glutathione taken orally, you can get it inside the cell without the consumption of energy. Similarly, vitamin C, when you give it intravenously, and I've done a lot of work with vitamin C, and I want to tell you, I'm not talking against intravenous vitamin C. I think when you're sick, you want to take as many different forms of vitamin C as possible. So I'm not even remotely suggesting that liposomal vitamin C should ever replace intravenous vitamin C. It should just be there to augment it. You know, sometimes you don't have the availability of everything. Many people don't. And under those circumstances, you have to form your clinical compromise as to what you're going to use. But when you give vitamin C intravenously, in its reduced active form, it has an active transport mechanism to go inside the cell. So you need to consume energy to get it inside the cell. When vitamin C has already been oxidized, it will pass into the cell, but then you need to consume energy to bring it back to its active form. So even when you give vitamin C intravenously, you're consuming energy to get an energy delivering substance inside the cell. And this is not the case with the liposome. I mentioned this already, that glutathione is the most important intracellular antioxidant, vitamin C the most important extracellular, that they have a tremendous synergy with each other. And generally when you're dealing clinically with different diseases, you want to cover as many bases as possible and addressing both vitamin C and glutathione allows you to optimize as best you can the intracellular redox balance in favor of reduction. Because it's been very well documented that vitamin C and glutathione levels are uniformly depressed both inside and outside the cell in virtually all chronic degenerative diseases. And when you've got somebody really sick, like they're in the intensive care unit with acute sepsis, which is a advanced infection into your blood, most of the time, vitamin C levels are no longer measurable. They're down to zero. So even though vitamin C can serve very much as an antibiotic in and of itself, we need to have a point in time where it's appreciated that whether you think or believe that vitamin C can kill a pathogen all by itself, you should understand that that pathogen and that that sepsis has totally destroyed and metabolize all the vitamin C in the body. So at the very least, if you want to give the person a chance to recover, you start giving vitamin C to replace those deficits. And we've recently had some studies, 2016, that show even fairly small doses of vitamin C have a substantial impact on decreasing the mortality of patients that are in sepsis in the critical care units. So, we've seen now that liposome encapsulated supplements are the best supplements currently available for optimal bioavailability, which we discussed toward the beginning of the presentation. And because of the energy sparing nature of liposome delivery of its payload, there are a number of situations where even though it seems counterintuitive and against common sense, which quite, quite, quite frankly is the way I regarded it early on. It, it didn't make sense to me until, of course, I researched it. Taking oral liposome encapsulated supplements at a lower dosage can often have an equal to better impact than that same nutrient given intravenously. And these days for vitamin C and glutathione, taking them in a properly liposome encapsulated form is certainly your best option in terms of bio delivery. It's also a great option in terms of economy. Like I said, I've loved, I've, I've loved intravenous vitamin C. I've used a great deal of it myself, administered to many patients, got wonderful results, but it's not always available. 
The patient's not always available. It always can't be paid for. So this is a very good partner to intravenous vitamin C for a wide range of conditions. I've put together what I call my multi-C protocol. And let me start by saying that you want to give somebody the option to keep things as simple economically and supplementation protocol wise as possible. So to that degree, I will say that probably a majority of patients, especially those with infections, can get the desirable clinical impact that they want by taking one form of vitamin C and pushing it to a maximum dosage and staying on it. Many people have resolved many, many different clinical situations around the world over the years by taking regular vitamin C, ascorbic acid, sodium ascorbate, taking a very high dose, and then usually doing other things like modifying their diet, and next thing you know, uh, their chronic condition has resolved or their tumor has disappeared, you name it. However, that doesn't happen all the time. And it's important to know that if that did not happen with one form of vitamin C pushed to a high dose, it doesn't mean that vitamin C has yet failed you clinically until you take multiple forms of vitamin C at an optimal dose. So the multi-C protocol and I recommend this for anybody with uh, an advanced chronic degenerative disease, an acute downhill clinical spiral, uh, if, they're, if they're not doing well in the hospital. Of course, if they're in the hospital, it's still difficult to impossible to get them vitamin C, but that's another story beyond this particular presentation. A very good way to give that patient their best chance of recovery or substantial improvement is the multi-C protocol, which involves the liposome encapsulated vitamin C. This, of course, allows optimal intracellular and intracellular organelle access. Also, it's very good to take what's called bowel tolerance doses of ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate powder and this allows an optimal extracellular access. Also, very importantly, all toxins are really pro-oxidants, free radicals. So when you get a lot of vitamin C into the gut, you immediately neutralize the toxins that have been formed from poor digestion of food before they get absorbed. Then you have oral ascorbyl palmitate, which is a fat-soluble form of vitamin C because typical vitamin C doesn't make its way into the fat, but ascorbyl palmitate will. And then you have the regular intravenous vitamin C, uh, the dosage depending on body size and clinical circumstance. But suffice it to say that when you apply all four together, you can get some results that are just beyond the pale. Now, a lot of people ask, well, uh, is, the less, is the lecithin bad for you, or is the phosphatidylcholine bad for you inside the liposome? I understand the vitamin C or the glutathione or the alpha-lipoic acid is good for you or whatever else is encapsulated, but what about the liposome itself? And as it turns out, there's a lot of studies out there on phosphatidylcholine and shows that phosphatidylcholine in and of itself is an antioxidant, it's an anti-atherosclerotic agent, helps prevent plaque formation, lowers cholesterol, gives a strong support to normal clinical, to normal liver function. It has an anti-inflammatory and ischemic, ischemia protection. Also, and this should make sense, it is the component of the cell walls. So giving liposomes can help repair defective cell walls that have already had areas of oxidative stress and toxicity. It helps protect the pancreas from toxic injury. It helps even dissolve cholesterol into bile, preventing gallstone formation. And it even has a metabolic role in the nucleus. Now I've mentioned, because they're commercially available, the 
vitamin C and the glutathione and the alpha lipoic acid and B vitamins and a few other things. But there have been a large number of agents already encapsulated in liposomes that pretty much come under the category of being nutrients, antioxidants, any one of which are good for you. And this includes vitamin C, glutathione, alpha lipoic acid, B vitamins, vitamin E. Now the vitamin E is fat soluble and it's something that associates with the cell wall. Vitamin A, beta carotene, L-cysteine and acetylcysteine, superoxide dismutase. Now that's the enzyme, okay? So that's got a lot of amino acids in it. So this is a way of delivering something that's not very well absorbed, taken by itself. Silybenin and silymarin, which are two agents that strongly protect the liver and the antioxidant status of the liver. ATP, they even have studies that show that giving ATP in liposomes can decrease the size of a myocardial infarction. They can help stop and reverse some of the damage to cells that have been put on the edge that could go either way. They get inside those cells, they normalize the oxidative stress, and you have a smaller heart attack. Quercetin, rutin, catalase, coenzyme Q10, resveratrol, melatonin, and just about any combination you can think of, of water-soluble agents. Now, having seen these basics of liposomes, let's now try to incorporate that into a basic understanding of digestion. And until I went into this particular literature research, I didn't realize how poorly I understood digestion. And I think many of my fellow physicians and healthcare practitioners also know a little bit less than they should about digestion because it explains a lot of the differences of how one agent versus another has a clinical impact. Start with the concept that digestion needs to break down food into forms small enough to pass through the intestinal cell membrane junctions or actually they'd be taken up by those cells. And you have basically three food groups. The proteins break down to peptides, break down to amino acids. The carbohydrates break down into larger sugars, break down into glucose. And then the fat components break down to fatty acids and glycerol. And then you have independent, if you will, positive molecules like vitamin C and vitamin E that aren't going to really break down into any of that but just be assimilated by itself. So, <clears throat> the enterocyte, which is the cell lining the gut, is the regulator. And the steps of lipid, and I'm talking about lipid because liposome falls under the category of lipid, it follows the steps of being enter into the intestinal cell, the enterocyte, be processed intracellularly, does some changes, and then exported into the mesenteric lymph. Now this is important because just about everything else other than small fats, that is the carbohydrates, the proteins, the large fats, those go from the enterocyte directly into the blood and the portal circulation. This bypasses what's called the first pass metabolism of the liver. So, the enterocyte assimilates, breakdowns, and resynthesizes foodstuffs into forms to be taken up by the blood and the lymph, portal circulation, lymphatic circulation. And when it gets in the lymphatic circulation, it can either go directly into the immune cells, of which there's very, very many surrounding the intestinal walls. What doesn't get taken up there then goes through the thoracic duct and into the bloodstream, still encapsulated in a liposome and able to be distributed throughout the body. <clears throat> and this is a picture where you can see that in the, in the single villus, you have a lacteal, which is the capillary equivalent of the lymphatic circulation. 
so that something that's fatty goes straight into the lacteal and then in the lymphatic circulation, something that's not a tiny fat goes into the other. And this is uh, the one in the middle, okay? And then there's a blood capillaries around the lymphatic vessel. And this is a micrograph of it. So this particular slide goes into what I just talked about. Uh, I'm not going to presume to try to oversimplify digestive physiology. There's a lot to it. But I will say that my cells liposomes and larger fatty acids are taken into the enterocyte, the intestinal cell, packaged into large fat-like molecules called chylomicrons. They go into the lymphatic cir circulation and then into the lacteals. And this ultimately results in these things along with liposomes being transported into the lymphatic situation, circulation to the thoracic duct. And this also helps explain why this homemade liposome, which are not really liposomes, still have a positive impact. Something that is an emulsion or a micelle formulation, which I believe is what these homemade preparations do, is they do get absorbed better, they get into the lymphatic circulation, so they get throughout the, better, throughout the body better, but they don't get the intracellular impact. And the only thing wrong with this is there's nothing wrong with people making their own, what they call liposome preparations at home. It's just that if they have an advanced medical condition such as cancer and they're not showing a positive response, then they'll say, vitamin C is not good for me, liposome encapsulated vitamin C is not good for me, and in fact, they've still not taken the liposome preparation. But these homemade formulations do have a superior effect to just plain vanilla vitamin C taken by itself. Now, I got to say, in the research that I've done on this, the science of digestion really, to be perfectly frank, has yet to completely address the issue of liposome absorption and assimilation. And in fact, it's very likely that a small percentage of liposomes do get taken up into the portal circulation as well as going through the ileal lymphatic circulation. Now, liposomes versus intravenous vitamin C or liposome encapsulated vitamin C versus IV vitamin C. My own personal observations regarding IV vitamin C and liposome encapsulated vitamin C began some 11 years ago and resulting in me reaching a conclusion that seemed so ridiculous I did the only logical thing a scientist will do, I ignored it. I ignored it until I saw the scenario repeat several times with myself and with other individuals and the observation basically being that I saw that liposome encapsulated vitamin C could have the same or even better positive clinical impact on an acute viral syndrome as fully five to tenfold more grams of vitamin C unencapsulated delivered directly into the blood. So after seeing this repeat several times, I said, well, it's about time you learned what a liposome is. And something that continues to occur, articles written on the web, even in the literature, is goes back to this whole concept again of bioavailability. And people still think and continue to think that if you got something into the blood, that's the gold standard. You've delivered it as well as it can be delivered. That is not true. And as a result, you have people out there, doctors, other scientists, trying to compare apples and oranges. By that I mean they look at a blood level after you take a liposome encapsulated product and they look at a blood level after you take the unencapsulated product. Well, if what you're measuring inside the blood is encapsulated in a liposome, 
even if that number is higher, lower, or the same as something that's unencapsulated, it means something entirely differently. For example, when you have vitamin C in the blood unencapsulated and you see the level over time drop down, that generally means metabolism or excretion into the urine. When you have a liposome encapsulated vitamin C, for example, in the blood, and over time you see that number go down, it means it's being deposited in the cells of the body. So two enormously different results from comparing different lab tests. As I mentioned before, and I want to put a little focus on this for a moment, liposome encapsulated vitamin C upon accessing the intestinal lymphatics after oral administration have increased access directly to immune cells. And there is a huge amount of immune cells in the gut to the point that the immune presence in the GI tract makes it effectively the largest immune organ in the body. Because of this, and because of its relationship to the lymphatics and the gut, some to much of the delivery of the liposome vitamin C payload can take place in these lymphatics before the liposomes proceed to the systemic circulation via the thoracic gut, effectively supercharging the affected immune cells, especially the monocytes and the white blood cells. And this is important because of this slide. Monocytes have, on the average, monocytes are the, the phagocytic cells that chew up other cells, and they're also the first cell to be ushered to an area of inflammation. Monocytes have, on the average, 80-fold, that's 80,000% 80, more vitamin C than the plasma. It's basically the fuel with which a phagocytic or immune cell uses to combat the inflammation or the infection taking place in a diseased tissue. Regular white blood cells, granulocytes, have on the average 25-fold more vitamin C than the plasma. The red blood cell, no difference from the plasma. Heart cells and kidney cells, which are very metabolically active, they'll have maybe 13-fold more. The other point to be taken from this is, and you can check all these references, I especially recommend checking the Evans and the Moser articles. The research the results, these conclusions were based on humans supplementing only two grams of vitamin C for five days. So we don't really know how high we can push the vitamin C content inside the monocyte. Maybe we can push it to 100-fold or 90-fold, in which case this is a good reason why prolonged supplementation, not just acute supplementation with vitamin C, especially in the liposome encapsulated form, can legitimately fortify and strengthen your immune system by basically putting more bullets in the gun. So, inflammation and infection always results in increased oxidative stress. They're basically synonymous. Increased oxidative stress always has associated levels of decreased vitamin C and other antioxidants. The presence of acute inflammation, which is part of all toxin exposure, infections, and chronic degenerative diseases, triggers the influx of monocytes. The monocytes are often the first cells to reach an area of inflammation. Why is this so interesting, at least to me? I just told you the monocytes have at least 80,000% more vitamin C concentrated inside them than the blood. When you consider the fact that it's an antioxidant deficiency caused by the inflammation, what would be the best cell to show up there at the outset? The cell that has the highest concentration of vitamin C. So I would suggest to you, certainly not proved in the literature, that one of the primary functions of the immune system, especially in an acute 
inflammatory response is to bring to that inflammatory response, which has been depleted of vitamin C and antioxidants, the one cell in the body that has the super highest concentration of vitamin C in it. So it's a reflex vitamin C delivery system to the area of the body needing it the most. So recap. The administration of vitamin C orally in a properly liposome encapsulated form allows, number one, direct delivery to the systemic circulation via the lymphatics, bypassing the first pass metabolism of the liver. Number two, liposome encapsulated vitamin C allows and facilitates a, an efficient loading <clears throat> of critical immune cells such as monocytes and granulocytes and other white blood cells with vitamin C, particularly in the intestinal lymphatics, but anywhere else in the body where they're encountered. Number three, <clears throat> as the liver is the area of the body that deals with a lot of toxicity, it's generally the primary organ in which we try to process toxins and eliminate them from the body, there does appear to be a limited delivery of this encapsulated vitamin C directly to the liver, which would be extremely therapeutic. Wherever you're dealing with toxins, the more antioxidants you can get in there, the better. Number four, liposome encapsulated vitamin C taken orally eventually results in a blood-borne delivery of vitamin, C and of vitamin C containing liposomes to all the cells of the body. And then finally, And amazingly, but it increases our armamentarium as clinicians that like vitamin C in all its forms, the clinical responses of liposome encapsulated vitamin C taken orally are comparable, occasionally superior depending on the clinical circumstance, but comparable nevertheless to even larger doses of vitamin C given intravenously. So if you're a clinician, Put this in your armamentarium. It can help a lot of different protocols and it will do nothing but make your patients happier and make you appear that much more a fantastic doctor to them. So thank you very much.